Now, few would expect 2017 to be a quiet one politically in Scotland. There's hardly been a quiet year at Holyrood in recent times, but with the triggering of Article 50, the local council elections, and the highly likely prospect of a second referendum on independence hanging in the air, what are the priorities for Scotland's political leaders this year? Well, yesterday we heard from Kezia Dugdale, and this morning it's our chance to speak to the leader of the SNP and the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who's here with us. Good morning to you. Good morning. What is your one big priority for 2017? Education. I've made that clear. That's my priority for this Parliament. As you've been reporting on your bulletins this morning, our consultation on education governance reform closes today. So we'll be getting on with that as well as pursuing the reforms we've already embarked upon in our schools and making sure that we see the impact of the additional investment through our attainment fund. Uh, jobs in the economy is also very important, which is why I'm also determined to do everything I can to avoid a hard Brexit. Well, we'll come to Brexit in just a second, but as you've mentioned education, uh, you've talked a lot about bridging the attainment gap over this parliament. There are hundreds of measures that quantify the gap between rich and poor. On which measure should people judge your government? Well, we've started uh, and the first iteration of this was published in December, just before Christmas. We will now be publishing on an annual basis uh, the percentage of pupils uh, from on a school by school as well as a local authority by local authority basis who meet the required standards of curriculum for excellence. And that information will be broken down, as I say, by school, by local authority, but also by demographics. So that, as we pursue uh, the, the way through this parliament will be the key measure both of standards overall in our schools but also of the, the gap and our success in closing the gap but between the need, richest and poorest pupils. We'd need league tables, wouldn't we, to actually make a comparison there and to actually judge you properly? Well, the figures will be uh, compared year by year. So you'll be able to look at any particular school and see uh, what the percentage of pupils meeting those required uh, standards were uh, last year next year, the year after that and the year after that. We'll also continue to have the, the PISA, the international uh, study that is done, which again we had published just before Christmas. So there will be more information than there has ever been before about the performance of Scottish schools and that is absolutely crucial to me being able to say to the Scottish people uh, whether or not we have succeeded in what I've set as my key challenge and key priority which is closing that attainment gap. But John Swinney said uh, at the time of the most recent PISA scores when they were very disappointing that they're unlikely to turn around come the next set of scores because of the, the time lag from the uh, exams being set and then the, the, the results coming out. So can we judge you or should we judge you well, on those PISA scores? If, if you can let me separate PISA scores from the new information that I've been talking about, the PISA study that we had published in December, and this is, I think, a key point, that was based on a survey that was carried out in Scottish education in March 2015, so it's almost two years old. Now, that time lag is out with our control. That is the, the time it takes to uh, assess and process that information and publish those results. But should we judge you on the next set then? It, I, I think it is reasonable to Look at, of course it's reasonable to look at the next set and see if there is progress being made. But what I'm saying is that there will always be a time lag. So you can't look at the ones in December and judge the reforms we've introduced because they predate those reforms. But the, the second key point, and I think it's actually the more fundamental point, is that we are introducing through uh, the new figures uh, and new reporting that I've spoken about much more real-time information about the performance of our schools, which will not have obviously any information like that has some degree of time lag but will not have that kind of time lag and from next year that information will also be informed by the new standardised assessments that we're introducing in schools so it will be very robust information based on teacher judgement but informed by that new standardised assessment system. A report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation suggested that by age five there's a gap of 10 months in mm -hmm. problem solving development and 13 months in vocabulary between children from low income and high High income households. Have you set a date for when that gap will be completely closed? Um, I'm not going to set what I've said and I've said very clearly and I'll say again today is over the term of this parliament I want to see a significant closing in that attainment gap. Now we will start to see that through what does the, significant the measurements. Mean? If it's a defining mission well, for you, what does significant I, I, I mean? Want, I want to see a substantial uh, closing. Now what we've done is provide the baseline in terms of the figures that were published in December. I want to see that substantially reduced over this parliament and I've said 
I want to see the uh, attainment gap effectively eliminated over a 10-year period. Now, I think that is, you know, not going to be easy. Nobody says it will be easy, but I think that is absolutely the right uh, priority to set. Now, you rightly talk about the importance of the early years. We've been talking so far this morning about schools, and it's in schools that we tend to see the the attainment gap and the success of efforts to close it. But because if, it we're going, if we're going to be successful, then we have to start before school, absolutely, which is why uh, action like increasing early years education, we've set uh, a very ambitious goal over the lifetime of this parliament to double the provision of state-funded early years education. But it's not just about quantity, it's about quantity as well. So we're taking steps to increase the numbers of teachers or, or childcare graduates working in nursery schools, particularly in our most deprived areas, so that we're improving the quality as well as expanding the quantity of childcare. Initiatives like the Baby Box that we are now piloting ahead of rollout uh, across the country from the summer, these are all part of a package of measures that taken together are about having a transformational impact on the life chances of young People. Are you disappointed that if it takes 10 years to substantially close this attainment gap, if not eliminate it, that you didn't do it in the past 10 years um, when you've been in power? I, I, don't, I don't accept that characterisation. I do accept that well, we've you said got you can much... do it in 10 years. Well, you've been in power for almost 10 years. And if you look at uh, some of the indicators around exam passes in our schools, if you look at, again, you know, going back to information that was published shortly before the Christmas break around the numbers of 18 year olds from our most deprived communities going into university now, which is higher than it's ever been, although not as high as we want it to be, then we can point to areas of progress over the, the years that the SNP has been in government. We've got record, amongst record uh, exam passes in our schools, we've got a record number of young people that go into what are called positive destinations. And record bad PISA scores. Uh, well, you know, we're not the only country to have seen a, a, a deterioration in PISA scores. I think there are, and this is by no uh, way meant to, to sound like an excuse, I think there are wider issues and some uh, educators education experts are, are talking about this in terms of how young people learn these days, the impact of, uh, you know, smartphones and tablets on the learning process. Now, these are, you know, issues that not just Scotland have to grapple with, all countries do. But I couldn't be clearer about the responsibility I feel. I've talked a lot of uh, times in the past about the impact of education in my own development, uh, and many people can do the same. Education is key to giving young people the best start in life and the best life chance chances later on in life. So I couldn't be clearer about the priority I attach to that. Let me ask you about Brexit because it's obviously going to dominate the year. You said in the immediate mm. aftermath of the vote that you wanted to explore Scotland remaining in the EU as a member while the rest of the UK left. That now seems to have changed over the past couple of months to seeking to maintain access to the single market. Membership of the single market. Well, are, are you no longer mm. seeking Scotland to remain but a member of the I, EU? I want Scotland to remain a member of the EU. But do you accept that's unrealistic? And well, what I'm trying to do, and you know, I ask people to to, to hear this and to listen to this uh, in the same good faith that I'm putting it forward in. I'm trying to s explore whether there is a way of building consensus and, and building unity around uh, the, the reality that different parts of the UK voted differently. Scotland voted to stay in, England and Wales voted to leave, Northern Ireland voted to stay in. Even in Scotland, which voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU, a million people voted to leave. So what I'm trying to do is to see whether with compromise and a focus on building consensus, there is a, a, a pr proposition that the maximum number of people can get behind. That's but you why haven't put that proposition forward, have you? Yes, I you? have. I put it forward on the 20th of December. Well, Scotland's place in Europe, you talk about it being committed to exploring with the UK government the mechanisms whereby Scotland could remain. Well, we, we, but we, we put forward, we're the only government anywhere in the UK that's put forward a comprehensive plan about how we move forward from this position. You know, more than six months after the referendum, we, we have a Prime Minister and a UK government that still hasn't put forward any answers to basic questions. So we've put forward a plan, which is, firstly, we want to try to work with others across the UK, across the political spectrum, to try to keep the UK in the single market. If that can't be done, then we want to explore ways and we've put forward how we think this can be done of keeping Scotland in the single market while continuing to protect free trade across the rest of the UK. Um, and we have said very clearly, of course, that would require additional powers for the Scottish Parliament. I think there's a lot of consensus starting to build around some of those additional powers, for example, on immigration. So we've put forward very detailed plans about how we avoid a hard Brexit. And the reason it's important to avoid a hard Brexit, let's not forget 
forget uh, is because that will have a devastating impact on our economy and on jobs. So I've, in a sense, been willing and I'm willing to put aside well, my preferred option of independence in the EU to see if we can explore a consensus and compromise option. So if there's a soft Brexit, then your talk of a second independence referendum comes off the table. In, I'm never going to stop arguing for independence. I think Scotland will become independent uh, and you know I think that's the direction of travel. But we're talking at the moment in the context of the Brexit vote. But if there's a, well, if, indeed, but if there's a soft Brexit, then it's no longer highly likely that we will have it, a second independence in referendum. In the time scale of, of Brexit is what we're talking about just now. And what I've said is if uh, we can find a way of protecting Scotland's economic interests, of protecting our democratic interests within the UK, then I'm up for trying to do that. I've put and forward then proposals... Taking independence off the table for Indep the short for, term. For, in terms of the timescale of, of, of Brexit, that's what I've been very clear about. Am I going to stop arguing for independence or believing in independence? Am I going to stop believing Scotland is on a journey to independence? No, but we're talking here in the particular context and timescale of Brexit. And I'm putting these proposals forward in, in good faith. I'm uh, deliberately saying, put my preferred option to one side and asking people if we can find you... a consensus and compromise option. Uh, it's been reported Theresa May uh, will say that Britain will come out of the single market unless the UK is given full control of its borders. I wonder whether, firstly, is that a positive stance as far as you're concerned in that she's still talking about being part well, of the single market? And do you appreciate that you know, she has to have a negotiating position? I absolutely agree. She has to have a negotiating position. The, the problem is she doesn't appear to, to have one. And you know, we've seen well, in the last couple... Full control of our borders... Well, means, con means we can stay in the single market. But what, where are, where are the tra trade-offs? Is single market uh, membership important to the UK government? I think it is so crucially important that that should be the priority. And I'm saying that very clearly. Now, I think anything we hear from Theresa May that tells us something we don't know, and with the greatest of respect, what you've just quoted to me doesn't tell us anything that she hasn't been saying for quite some time now. Anything that tells us something we don't know is a step forward. It is, frankly, you know, just beggar's belief that so many months on from the referendum, we still don't know answers to those basic questions. So I hope before too much time elapses, we do have a clear negotiating strategy from the Prime Minister. I hope she incorporates in that negotiating strategy the proposals that we've put forward in the document I published just before Christmas. Uh, we'll continue to operate in a way that is absolutely first and foremost about protecting Scotland's economy and protecting the kind of open, outward-looking society we want Scotland to be. If you don't get what you want, you've, you've talked about independence being back on the table. The economics of independence would be key to any new vote. You asked Andrew Wilson to chair an expert group on the economy. He was due to publish that report or give it to you by the end well, of last year. Have you seen it? He's He, he was asked to, to give me an interim uh, report. He's given me an update. He is still uh, carrying out that work and we will publish that work in, in due course. Has of he course, answered the currency question? Uh, look, um, we'll publish that work in due course. I'm not going to get into that before he's completed the task that I asked him and a, a range of other people to do. Of course, if we are uh, asking people to consider again the, the question of Scottish independence there are key questions that it will be incumbent on those of us proposing independence to answer. But this is going to be a very different debate if we are in that debate from the one in 2014. Because, is, there a, is it a harder because, sell for you to sell independence uh, no, if Scotland I, is out I of the EU? I think if we are in this position we're in this position because Scotland has found itself in a position we didn't ask to be in, being taken out of the European Union having no control over the direction of travel that has such an impact on our economy and society and surely, you know, it's right for me, I think, as First Minister to explore all options and that's what I continue to try to do. But it cannot be right in any circumstances for Scotland to be completely powerless over the direction the country is taking. And if you get those powers through Brexit repatriated from Brussels to Holyrood and you get your desire, mm. which is independence and then membership of the European Union, you give those powers over agriculture, fisheries, etc. back to Brussels. I don't, I don't, I don't, Again, you know, this comes down to, I think, a mischaracterisation of what being in the European Union oh, no, means. It's not a devolving institution. Well, but it, it controls fisheries, it controls, it, it controls it's, agriculture. It, it's have an, to have it's an institution back. where independent countries come together uh, to deal with certain issues that are better dealt with uh, in, in, by countries on that basis. Now, you know, you go to France or Germany uh, or, or Spain or Portugal, these countries don't uh, say that they're any less independent by being in the European Union. You know, I'm, I'm a Scottish nationalist as we've spoken about many times in the past and will do in the future, I believe in independence. But in the interdependent world we live in, I also believe that all countries should work together where that makes sense. We're grateful for your time this morning. Thank you for coming Thank in you. to speak to us, the SNP leader and First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. We'll speak to the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Ruth Davidson, on Monday's programme.